I remember, I remember Dick Bell. Yeah. And then another year, I think a couple years, six years, we traveled around a lot. Uh, and then another year, I think a couple years, um, he was a good guy. I actually called him Richard. And then another year, I think a couple years, I remember one year I came back down to South Florida and I was driving down US-1, doing well then. I think he was still living here in town. And then another year, I think a couple years went by and I came back down to visit. I was back down US-1. Yeah, Nick Velvet. Here's to you. All right. Last time we uh, were talking about Billabong, when I first went to Billabong, um, it was the coolest bar. It was owned by a very good friend of mine. His name was also Dick, and uh, he was the coolest dude. I don't think he liked me very much off the bat, because when I went in there, I ordered a Coke. I was trying to be clean and sober, and you know, I was just looking for a change, and uh, so I ordered a Coke, and this, amazing bartender Jill also had the very strange look on her face looking around in a really cool place probably it's actually about yeah a couple hours uh this guy walks up and stands next to me and he's ordering a drink that and I look over it looks over his hey buddy and I introduced myself like just right off the tip of his tongue want to go outside and smoke a joint and so I just smiled and was like, yes, I would absolutely love to go do that. We went out there and we were talking. He told me he was a guitar player. I told him that I was interested in kind of starting up a band. I was given the history of the circus and everything like that. And it's amazing how much information you can give somebody in the length of a joint. When we went back in the bar, I went and sat on my stool and he went in the back. He was actually playing the uh, foosball with some of the guys. So I sat there and I was talking more to Jill, the bartender. And she was telling me the history of the bar and how long Dick owned it and the fact that the guy in the back bumper who was cooking your burger was an ex-FBI agent. So, uh... <laughs> It made you a little damn nervous. Um, great bar. So I wound up going there uh, probably every Thursday because the same people kind of were there on Thursdays as well. And that's how I kind of like got to know Kevin more, man. He just kind of spotted me and he'd be like, let's go out and smoke. And these two other dudes kept, uh, that were coming with him and it was these two guys and they were playing foosball with him and this other dude, Chris. But every time that we went back in after smoking a joint, I kind of went to the bar, my seat, and they would go back and play foosball. Because it was in the back of the bar, uh, past like pool tables and stuff. So I went over there and I was just watching them. And then that's when we all kind of start talking and turns out that uh, Chris, the guy that's playing, is, is a singer in a band. So I'm like already interested, I'm like, you know, asking him questions they're telling us like you know hey you should uh come out and see us you know they play like every weekend and uh they were called the repeat offenders they were like hey let's meet at this bar and i think the call i'm not sure what the bar was called i think it was called like fat cats but we went this guy is amazing I mean, this Chris guy, he's, uh, you know, he's jumping on tables, throwing napkins, getting shots, just doing everything that a rock star could do in a small bar. That solidified it right there. I wanted to be like this guy. Kevin, in, at that time, had invited me over to uh, his house to just do a little jamming, you know. So I went over to Kevin's house. He had a guitar. And we would just hang out and smoke, and he'd strum, and I'd kind of come up with words, and just had some fun with it. And then uh, that's kind of when I started drinking again, because I, you know, Kevin was drinking, and everybody else was, and you know, I just was starting to feel a little stale in the situation. And, um, that's where we were hanging out. So I started drinking again and uh, everything was going really well. We were actually coming up with some really good songs and it was many, 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 many weeks later uh, hanging out at the bar, seeing the band, the repeat offenders. You know, Kevin and I were looking at each other and, you know, thinking like, you know, we should really maybe plug into this some more. 
what wound up happening um, was we were having a lot of fun we were making up stupid songs. I had bought a bass. Because <clears throat> I was going to try to learn how to play bass with Kevin. I could not play bass. But B, he, he picked it up and almost immediately started playing. It was amazing. Him and Kevin were in the garage, like, looking at each other, coming up with songs. Um, and it turns out that Moo had previously drummed before. Kid across the street, whose dad we used to drink with, had a drum set, and we would secretly go across the street and seal his drum set <laughs> so that we could play. Um, we always brought it back and put it... So it kind of turned out that we were gonna start a band. And words. We had a microphone. And, uh... The only thing left really to do was, uh... Sing. Every position was full. And, uh, that's exactly what I did. So, um, we started off with covers, and but I really pushed originals. Um, I had a lot of poetry. I really wanted to do originals, because Kevin was a good enough guitar player that we could come up with our own stuff. And Blaine was fucking amazing uh, on uh, the bass. I mean, it was like he had played it before. He swears he never played it, but I didn't believe him. Seth was doing really well on the drums. I was screeching along on the uh, vocals. It started to kind of turn that way where we were, had more originals. We were coming up with songs like Cold Steel Train and Fogel Circus and stuff that was like really unique to us because my, my theory was is that if I did an original, nobody would know I sucked. But if I did a cover, they could see that I wasn't that good. I mean, we had like about seven of our own original songs and then a couple of covers. Kevin at his bar in his house uh, came up to all of us and said that he had got us our first gig. <laughs> we didn't even know. And uh, Mooby and me, man, I think we all shit ourselves. Uh, we didn't think anything was happening, to, you know, shown us a video um, he had been used to this he had played out at gigs before he is none of us had done this before I had always wanted it but man when he told me it was happening man I fucking I wanted to hide so we got this gig at the um, yeah the first first gig we had was the freeze freezer I think it was called um, well, you know, when we got the when we got the gig, it was a couple of weeks of like nervous tension, and we were practicing and practicing in Kevin's garage, and we were really trying to get a solid tight set, and we did. We got there. There were a lot of people there to support us. We got up on stage, and Chris introduced us. And when he introduced us, I I almost passed out, man. I literally at some point. You can see me holding the microphone. I'm holding it because it's holding me up. And I turn for a little bit of comfort and I find that Blaine, <laughs> B, my buddy, has uh, backed into the shadows of the stage. <laughs> you can't even really see him. And uh, we do well. We bust out a couple of songs. People are applauding. I'm sweating. I'm scared to death. But we've rehearsed, so we're doing well. And then the whole kind of set ends. And it sucks because we just had found it. Like we all looked at each other and we knew that there was like a band there that we had joined. And that last song really kind of just jammed. And 
It was amazing. And it really changed everything after that. We practiced a lot more and we kept seeing the, you know, the repeats and Chris was really helping me out. He actually was showing up to our practice, especially me because I was not a great singer. Actually, at the first gig we hit at the Freeze, the guy that was running the soundboard uh, even came up to me and told me that uh, I was the worst singer he had ever seen from that. Um, and I worked on it. first gig we had was the freeze and then um, actually the uh, second gig was a motocross rally that we played that had monster trucks and uh, we wound up setting up our equipment on a flatbed tow truck uh, right outside the track and when everybody um, was done racing they came out and we were still playing and so we wound up doing a whole entire show just for the riders and they loved us more than anybody. Actually, the Elbow Bar in Fort Lauderdale. We uh, got up there and uh, we started playing. And we set up, and it's on the ocean, so you're literally set up on your, you know, stage and everything, and you overlook in the ocean. Um, so we were really excited about that, and really started to. Uh, Kind of, we were really nervous, like right off the bat. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Good morning, Mr. Velvet. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. My breakfast. Thank you. And we were really nervous about the gig. It was like uh, because it was a pretty packed bar. It was a lot of people we didn't even know. So we started playing, and we played our first song, which we chose to do uh, an original. <laughs> when we finished the song. Um, Nobody clapped. Uh, not one person. They weren't even even really looking at us. <laughs> no intention, you know. So we busted out another song and to see if it would get any better. And realistically, it didn't get any better. And they didn't clap again. So we had to have a little sit down with the audience. We're not trying to get famous. We're just trying to pay our part to have like you. We're just a bunch of drunks and we want to have fun. And needless to say, the rest of the evening, great gig. They loved us. And then that's when we got the Orlando gig. That's when the jacket got stolen. And as the as we were doing gigs, we were doing it, like I said, Atlanta, Kansas. Things were going smooth. Uh, we were having a good time. We were coming up with new songs. We were practicing a lot. And uh, I'm an early bird. I do not do well at night. And that's when I started to get heavy into cocaine. In the beginning, nobody really cared, but when we started to get a bit more popular, you know, the demons showed up and uh, they knew I loved it and they were always there. And I was doing a lot and I was actually buying a lot. She took my heart and she took my wine. I should have learned she does it all the time. And then I was buying pills, and I was pretty much convinced that the only way I was going to be able to perform was on drugs. B and Moo were uh, always very neutral. They were even keeled guys, man. They never were really getting upset about very much. It was always Kevin and I. Were. And uh, we were in a parking garage, and Kevin and I, had, and I said something to each other. And uh, he got furious, man, and he charged me. Um, but he was so drunk that I literally just stepped out of the way when he approached me, and he wound up falling, just tripping. And he lost his shoes and shit. And the rumor is that I hit him. And I swear to God, I never hit him. I just stepped back, and the guy fucking tumbled to the ground. And uh, I guess he got hurt. And everybody was saying, uh, B was like, man, you fucking took him out. And I was like, I didn't fucking hit him. I was like, I didn't take a swing at him, nothing. But rumor is I hit him. So it was always Kevin and I that were having problems. Um, and I was getting a spit, 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 I was get
which I can't sing as he did, so it made it sound even worse. Um, the more I started taking pills and stuff, it became really apparent to everybody in the band that I was doing this, you know. Seth and Blaine at one point even made some sort of mention that my eyes were bugging out of my head. And so I really started to get worried. But we were getting more and more gigs. Um, one of the cooler gigs we got was uh, we were in Key West. Because why? I'm crazy. Are you crazy? All right. Those people said you were. I just had to check it out. Fantasy Fest event was going on, and if you built a float, um, you got to uh, be in the parade. So we wanted to be in the parade down there, and uh, so we already had like this van that was uh, painted like a clown that used to drive Thank you. around to our gigs. It wasn't very reliable. It, I don't even. It didn't even have a roof, but it had a bunk bed welded to it. And uh, we took that everywhere. So that was going to be our towing vehicle. We just needed a trailer. So we got a trailer and we started to decorate it. And we were working for months on it, you know. And uh, we were having a great, great time building it and everything. It was very exciting. We had a lot of people in on the project. It wound up working out very cool. We just had some electrical problems. And uh, when we got to Key West with everything, we still had to assemble the trailer and all the electronics and everything and the lights and the sound and everything. Uh, that's not what happened. Somebody pulled up and said, so when we should have been working on the trailer for the parade, out in the keys. So when we woke up in the morning, we had to like really kind of just get it all together quick. We had to get in line at the parade and everything and get in our position. The equipment wasn't ready, it wasn't working. Everybody else's floats were all ready to go and everything. We were scrambling. We were really, really scrambling to get that thing running. And uh, we did. We really did by the grace of God. Of course, we had more beer than we needed, but the thing wasn't running. So we had our priorities in line. Uh, the parade was great. It was really unbelievable. So many, I've never played to so many people in my life. And uh, at the end of the parade, Kevin decides, Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, I would like to welcome you to one of the greatest shows on earth. Welcome to the Fogo Circus. He makes it so that the trailer is almost even barely drivable, and we almost barely get out of here. <laughs> Zebra with its stripes, stripes. I do not have anything you like. That kind of killed the clown band. This is the Vogel Circus. Vogel Circus! That's where they go. You know. We couldn't really drive it much after that. We tried. Somehow Moo and I were always driving that thing, man. Um. Uh, one of the last gigs we played uh, uh, was in Brownsville, Texas, which, if you notice, is uh, very close to the Mexican border. Played a regular gig, small bar, something called like McMullies or some fucking thing like that. And uh, 
And when we finished, we noticed, uh, B, Moo, and I noticed that we couldn't find Kevin, which was not anything out of the ordinary. Kevin has a bar ADD where he can't stay in a bar too long. That he might have gone to a bar close by or something. Um, and after a while, we had a couple drinks. We noticed that we still couldn't see him or Junior. And Junior is like his sidekick of uh, drinking. Uh, they uh, pair up very well. So after a while, we kind of got worried. And then the bartender mentioned that. So uh, he, we, oh yeah, after talking to the bartender, a while, we found out that he was talking about going across the border. And... We, <laughs> so... <laughs> we wound up partying in Mexico for a few days, and I, um... Now here is a story about my friend Chivas. He done moved in charge of holding some money for a gas for gas i may have been on a few hit of acid a few hits of acid i you know and i walked by this tent this we got back in the van and everyone's like hey what's that and i'm holding this ceramic wolf like a baby and i'm like i bought it and they're like what did you buy it with and i was like with the money. We knew somebody in Brownsville we would be able to hook up with, so it was no big deal. But by this time, we were kind of all fed up with each other. And um, everybody was really getting tired of my drug use. And I just was constantly fucked up. And so when we got back, uh, we didn't practice for a while. We didn't play for a while. We really didn't do anything for a while. and uh, then. It was actually about three years before uh, we would get back together again. And we did it because a good friend of ours requested uh, that we play a party for him. So that was our motivation behind it. And it was a pretty big gig. We had practiced for it and spent a lot of time like working on it and stuff like that, getting geared up again. and. Uh, Uh, I kind of went on a bender. The number you have dialed has been changed. The, new, the number you have dialed And I missed the gig changed. entirely. When I woke up, I had a cell phone full of nasty messages from guys. And, you know, they were there, and I didn't even show up. I didn't call and nothing. I just fucking was passed out, and uh, that was kind of the end of it. Uh, they were fed up, and they were actually a guy in Key West named Captain Marchand uh, was going that night and singing some songs with them, and they actually wound up having a good gig, and they took him on as a singer. So I was kind of out. You know, I really had let like the three guys I love most completely down, and uh, so everything kind of just changed at that point. gig and the boys were really upset with me. Uh, I knew I had to make a change and I, I wanted to get off drugs and quit and everything but I just, I couldn't where I was because every time I turned around man, there was somebody there. I decided that I just really kind of wanted to go back home and I never kept in touch with anybody. 
so I don't know what happened to them. Drove back to uh, Tennessee to uh, the circus. And uh, when I got there, it wasn't there. Nothing was there. The only thing that was there was the house that uh, we had lived in. That was abandoned. I kind of just moved in. That's when I met. Can you turn off the light? She's an amazing musician. She got out of that car, man, and it was over.